Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Naylor, and I'm privileged to serve as the President and CEO here at the National World War I Museum. And I couldn't be more delighted than to welcome such an energetic and full crowd here tonight for this very important lecture as part of this series. So welcome. We're really delighted to have you here. We're delighted to have uh, those in the overflow area and also those who are watching uh, or who will be watching on podcasts. We're just really pleased to have you all as part of this important uh, series. We're so proud to be partnering with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and the National Archives of Kansas City on this eight-part speaker series for a state of deception, the power of Nazi propaganda. If you're newer to the National World War I Museum, welcome. Uh, this is one of those uh, real treasures of Kansas City. We're the number one rated attraction in Kansas City on TripAdvisor, something we're very proud of. And it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Debbie Ballard, who's the Director of Community Affairs for Sprint, who's an important community partner of many organizations and including of this series. Debbie was instrumental in helping the Midwest Center secure financial support from the Sprint Foundation for this project for which we're all grateful and for which we are all benefit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Debbie Ballard. So good evening, and I'm so pleased to be here this evening and to have this opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Ann Millen is an historian in the Leadership Programs Division of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's National Institute for Holocaust Education. Before joining the Institute staff, she served as a special assistant to the director of the Museum Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies and Program coordinator of the Miles Lerman Center for the Study of Jewish Resistance. Dr. Millen holds a bachelor's degree in speech theater from the McAllister College, a master's degree in religious studies from Vanderbilt University, and a PhD in Jewish history from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Her scholarly research focuses on the history of Jewish social welfare Fair work in Germany and Austria and Jewish forced immigration from Vienna. Most specific to tonight's topic, Dr. Millen is the co-curator of the website for State of Deception, the Power of Nazi Propaganda, as well as for the exhibition currently on display at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial M Museum, Some Were Neighbors, Collaboration and Complicity in the Holocaust. Please join me in welcoming officially Dr. Ann Millen to Kansas City. Good evening. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. I bring you greetings from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and especially from my good colleague, Dr. Uh, Robert Williams, who originally was going to be speaking to you tonight. He's a member of the International uh, Task Force on Holocaust Memorialization and Education, and he had to uh, decline the invitation because he needs to be in Ukraine, where he is right now uh, dealing with uh, a situation pertaining to the unrest there. Um, he sends you his greetings as well. Um, I was thrilled to spend the afternoon in the exhibition of this museum, and I have to tell you, I've seen many museums. This is a, a museum of superlative quality in every way, and you should be extremely proud. It's also a, a, an important subject matter. Um, I. When we were putting together State of Deception, we found that to properly contextualize the Nazi period in the use of propaganda, we had to push the date lines out and to go as far back as World War I. And I hadn't spent much time with World War I, but uh, in researching this exhibition, I began to understand how much World War I shapes the world we live in to this very minute and is not ancient history, it's history 
history that's very much alive and with us every day. So if you haven't seen your splendid, splendid exhibition, please, please take a day and, and go and see it. Uh, tonight, I am going to uh, talk about the images of women and girls in Nazi propaganda. And uh, I, this is the first time I've done it. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was asked, I, I've spoken on state of deception many times, and I thought, gee, what, what fresh thing can I, I, I say about it? Um, for the three years it was up, I was one of the two designated speakers who went all over the country speaking on it, and we kind of had, you know, a standard uh, spiel, but I didn't want to do that here. I really wanted to take this as a wonderful opportunity to look at a part of of the exhibition that was um, planned, but we could never really pull it out as a theme and develop it in detail. So I, I, I wanted to do that, and um, I'm delighted to, to share that research with you. In uh, Nazi Germany, girls and women were subordinated to the goals of the state. Both the Nazi party and the Nazi state were male-dominated institutions. From 1920 on, the party forbid women to be members of the leadership of the party, and after 1933, uh, forbid them to be leaders in the state. Um, Nazi propaganda sought to win women over and to mobilize them to create what's called in German the Volksgemeinschaft, or the national community. Um, if you were here for my colleague Will Meineke, you know that the national community was, in the Nazi perception and ideology, a uh, unified, racially-based community, people of pure Aryan race was the term they used, basically white Nordic. Um, and they were to uh, act for one another's benefit, not as individuals, but for the whole, in the struggle with other peoples for Lebensraum, for living space and the resources and human resources uh, that came with that living space. In other words, it was a constant struggle uh, that would sharpen uh, the quality of the race and would uh, bring out their, their best qualities. The uh, Germany's women and girls were coordinated into their own organizations under state and party oversight, which aimed to produce race conscious, obedient, self sacrificing German women who would produce and educate future generations for the Fuhrer and the fatherland. Further, uh, National Socialist propaganda aimed to prepare the country for war and to create a climate of acceptance for the elimination of Jews and others deemed undesirable by the Nazi state. Uh, tonight, I'm going to explore with you how Nazi propagandists used images of women and of girls to convey their vision of the national community and to rally Germans, both male and female, young and old, to support national socialist policies. Now that women would support the national socialist, German women of the time, would support the national socialist, when you look at it at face value, seems counterintuitive. Why? Well, as I mentioned, the party was male dominated. There really was no role for women, a role for women uh, in the leadership. Secondly, uh, Nazi ideology saw women uh, as biologically determined and that their primary task was what they called species upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> There's a euphemism for you. Uh, and third, uh, from the end of World War I on, uh, Germany had the largest and most active feminist community and national feminist organization in the world. And yet, women chose the National Socialists. And, and let me say that again, they chose. They were not 
uh, brainwashed. They were persuaded. And they were persuaded in part by propaganda that told them what they wanted to hear. That's how propaganda works. We are not, each of us, innocent of propaganda. If we do what propaganda tells us to do, it's because we have a prior desire, whether we know it or not, conscious or unconsciously, to do what the propaganda has suggested, to want what the propaganda is talking about. Uh, and I'll go into that a little more deeply when I talk about the conditions in interwar uh, Germany that, that uh, shaped the way uh, Nazi women, or German women received uh, the Nazi arguments. So uh, how then did women come to accept the roles as described by a Nazi ideology and a patriarchal Nazi state? And why? Why did they choose second-class citizenship? For they did choose. Now, I want to make it very, very clear from the ending, from the beginning, I beg your pardon, that I'm not in any way implying by, by looking at this particular group in the German population that these women suffered uh, in the way in which, suffered as second class citizens in the way in which Jews, Roma, homosexuals, uh, trades unionists, and other targeted groups suffered in the case of Jews and Roma unto death. There is no comparison. These targeted groups had no choice. Women chose. Uh, and why, why did they choose? What, what did they gain? Well, we'll go into that a bit. Um, my remarks are going to have two parts. Uh, first of all, the context, uh, interwar conditions that shaped uh, the way in which women became vulnerable to uh, uh, Nazi solutions to uh, social, economic, and political crises. And secondly, uh, we'll go through a number of images and talk about some of the strategies. And we're going to see again and again certain sets of images and I call them the maid, the, the girl, uh, the mother, and then also um, the family. And we'll see those in various elaborations. Um, so, let's begin. Those of you who were here for Will Meineke's uh, uh, speech will uh, notice that a first couple of these uh, slides um, were used in his presentation. Will and I decided that it'd be a good idea to help you kind of recall the things that he said, and also because he talked about uh, these, uh, use these slides as background for talking about primarily male experience. I'm going to use them to talk about female experience, and hopefully this is going to work. <laughs> it does. All right. Here is Germany, Germania, in August 1914, at the beginning of World War I. There she stands, Brunhilde, Valkyrie, proud, strong, able to defend herself, healthy, whole, she has a fierce look in her eye. No one's going to mess with this woman. Germania, the woman, has traditionally, uh, for centuries really, been um, the one of the primary uh, symbols of the German state. The other, of course, is the great eagle, and you'll see that turning up in the propaganda as well. Uh, this is a painting uh, by Friedrich August von Kaulbach, and it was uh, life-size and hung in the Parliament building. And here is Germany in 1920. She is broken, ravished, stripped, all her possessions lie on the ground. She's tied to the martyr's stake with barely a ray of hope coming from the gathering storm clouds and wolves impinging upon her to tear her apart. These two images of Germania 
tell you something about what German women experienced, German men too, German children, in that four year period from 1914 to 1918. Um, Germany lost two million men in World War II which then caused a post-war demographic imbalance, a surplus of 1.8 million women of marriageable childbearing age. In other words, uh, World War I virtually wiped out one generation of German men. Births in some parts of Germany declined as much as 50%. Contraceptives came along. Um, but they were very controversial, as was abortion, and they were adding to the declining birth rate. Here you see one of the great uh, posters of, of uh, Kate Kollwitz, uh, a, a communist and socialist artist, and it says, uh, down with the uh, abortion law. Uh, which prevented women uh, who had multiple children and simply were too impoverished to support more from having access to abortion. Uh, World War I had liberated uh, women in a way that was unexpected, as you uh, will find in your own exhibition, and, and I took uh, these rules from the exhibition script. Women in Germany, uh, likewise in America and, and other parts of Europe, uh, during World War I came out of the home and began working in factories, in armaments works, as nurses, doctors, postal workers, telephone Feminists, agricultural workers, and to my surprise, even miners. All traditional war rules have been broken by the war. In 1919, uh, the Weimar Constitution, uh, that's the, the name of the republic that exists uh, in Germany from approximately 1920 until 1932. It's a constitutional republic with a very fine constitution with a fatal flaw. And uh, it gave women the right to vote, something they had been longing for, something they had been fighting for. It also gave them the right to stand for election from the local level all the way up to, but not including, the national parliament. By 1925, however, one-tenth of all local elected officials were women, so they were beginning to slowly break into the political system. One-fifth of university student body was now women, and that was from uh, the 1890s, uh, coming up from the 1890s when women were not allowed into many European universities. 1% of German university professors were women. In male-dominated uh, professions, such as teaching, uh, there were, by 1925, 100,000 new female teachers. And medical profession added 3,000 women doctors. In 1922, 1923, hyperinflation drove more women into the labor market. And by 1925, labor force had increased by one third from what it was in 1907. That is, it, it before the war, it is 8.5 million, and uh, by 1925, it's 11.5 million out of a total population of approximately 64 million Germans. For the first time, women are competing for jobs held by men, traditionally. In 1929, uh, the Depression causes massive unemployment. Uh, six million are unemployed by 1932. Two million more uh, have given up. And some of the history of the interwar period just simply rings a bell today, doesn't it? Uh, they no longer uh, registered with labor bureaus. More men were laid off than women because, frankly, women were cheaper to hire. Nothing changes, right? <laughs> <laughs> women formed 37% of the workforce, but 
a, a woman who filled a skilled job that was otherwise held by a man made 66% of the man's wages, and unskilled laborers made 70% of a man's wages. There were more men than women on the dole. They were unable to marry, unable to support a family, and unable to establish a trade or a profession, and they were resenting it. Uh, German veterans from World War I returned to a bewildering Germany, modernized in their absence. Gone were the small communities, the tremendous growth in the size and the populations of cities, the speed of urban life. You can see here, this is Potsdamer Platz. And imagine being a, a young a soldier who, when you left for the front, would come by here in a horse-drawn carriage and returning four years later to see this. This caused, along with the unemployment, what has been termed by scholars a crisis in masculinity among German men. They had lost the war. They had lost 13% of German territory. They had lost 100,000 men. Uh, or their army military force was reduced down to 100,000. The whole system of authority, traditional authority, in which men were dominant had disappeared, along with the monarchy and the aristocracy, which uh, assured it. Um, occupations and livelihoods were that they had dreamt of on the front were denied to them, training, uh, apprenticeship. And uh, they came home to what they felt was the chaos of modernity. Mass production in factories, um, changes in living conditions, mass housing, challenged the folk-based style of living. Department chain and foreign stores like Woolworths um, challenged small businesses. Some things really never change, right? Uh, new technologies challenged the old artisan guilds. The perception of a world that had passed away was very, very strong among the German veterans returning from World War I. And it caused alarm and anxieties. And these anxieties, scholars have found, were, began to focus largely on women and on Jews as responsible uh, for what the men were suffering. Young unmarried women abounded. They were economically, socially, and sexually independent. Married women were allowed to work uh, suddenly, and were what were called double earners, both their husbands, and they uh, earned a, a, a salary. And prostitution, deviancy, and venereal disease were on the rise, and to some men's eyes, the embittered men, uh, women were driving these forces. The new woman, here well, there she is. Now, historians uh, disagree as to whether or not uh, she actually existed or whether she was an invention of the media. Uh, there's a very strong scholarly debate on this. But she certainly was a fantasy both to be desired or feared, or both, in the minds of German men. Um, who often characterized her as a sexual anarchist, out to destroy social order, committing racial suicide by not performing her biological duty. She should return to tradition and return to the home, produce and educate children, and keep herself pure for her husband and for the nation. She should return to the blood and the soil from which Germans draw their strength, their language, and their culture. So ran the uh, perception of the men who saw her in this way. The reaction of the feminists was ambivalent. Um, Weimar Republic did give women the vote, but it did not remove discrimination against women. The Reichstag political parties still were represented by men, and therefore women's issues were never legislated, or they were legislated against women. 
feminists were under attack uh, in the press, and they went on the defensive. They marginalized their radicals in order to survive, and they decided not to push too hard for major changes. They emphasized nationalism. In other words, they began a slow move to the right. They were against the Versailles Treaty, as were the parties of the right, including the Nazis. They were against both the Young and the Dawes plan for reparations. They were for rearmament, which was forbidden by the Versailles Treaty. They were for family values and they were for sexual restraint. So uh, feminist women are, are not only ambiguous in the way in which they're receiving criticism, they're ambiguous in the way in which they're responding to it. In general, uh, the parties of the middle, which, on which a democracy really depends to hold it together and to get something done and to make compromises to move forward, had failed. They were deadlocked. They could no longer act. Again. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think history repletes itself, but I think sometimes it really makes our shoes pinch. <laughs> Most voters uh, by 1932 are voting for, I beg your pardon, by 1929 uh, are voting for the Communist Party on the far left and the Social Democrats on the middle left. And on the other side, there really is no um, conservative alternative to those uh, conservative parties that attempted to go into coalition and hold the middle, except the National Socialists. And gradually, 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 the vote count, the vote totals, election after election, local, regional, and national, the Nazi party begins to move up. That is to say that most voters had rejected Republican democracy and were voting for anti-Republican uh, parties, Republican with a small r. That's to say that most Germans then, if their votes are any evidence, wanted to get rid of parliamentary democracy and had abandoned hope that it would ever work. And this is really shocking because most Germans, remember, were as middle class and ordinary and sort of slightly right of center as you and I are, where the average American lives. Just imagine the average German in the same place at that time. And because that center, which they had trusted, had failed, they were now moving to other options, the only other options they saw available. Uh, teaches us strongly the fragility of democracy and, and the vigilance with which, which we must defend it and also the energy with which, with which we must insist upon engaging in it. They were tired of democracy. Uh, they were tired of demonstrations and uh, lawlessness in the street. In one street brawl, 91 people died in Berlin in 1928. They were tired of the long lines at the welfare office and of the social chaos. And uh, also they were tired of the reliance of rule by decree, which was the fatal flaw in the Constitution, that if the parliament could not act or the republic were threatened, the president had the right to suspend parliament or override parliament and issue executive decree. The perception was that there was a breakdown of cultural and moral values. And they began, as I say, to move to the right, to Hitler. Here is one of the most famous uh, Nazi uh, 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 political posters from the 1932 campaign. It says, the last hope, our last hope, Hitler. Doesn't matter what the question is, Hitler is the answer. And all these downtrodden people, including mother and child and the crone behind her, 
Now, women on the left were, of course, appalled by the program of the Nazi party, but they were significantly outnumbered by women on the middle and on the right. Um, they wanted to restore what they termed normality. They wanted a community like the, a community they had experienced during World War I, when everyone decided that they would declare a truce, what's called in German a Burgfrieden, and uh, set aside their political arguments for the good of the nation to pull together and to win the war. Uh, and they shared the point of view on the natural sexual division of labor, according to the Nazi theory. And deep down, many German women, if not most, even the feminists, had reached the point where rather than the chaos of modern world and its responsibilities, they wanted to be wives and mothers and not have to compete with their husbands for jobs in order to feed their children. We don't have any public opinion polls from the period. That There were no public opinion polls of the Gallup type that were done in Germany until 1945, but there were public interest surveys done. And in only a few places uh, were the votes that men and women cast ta tabulated separately, women and men. So from this scant uh, information, we can find that in the late 1920s, more men than women voted for and joined the Nazi party. However, by 1932, conditions are so bad in the country, culturally, politically, economically, socially, uh, that uh, those persons voting for Adolf Hitler are virtually divided equally, men and women. In January of 1931, uh, the National Socialist Party membership is only 77,000. A year later, it's risen to 500,000, and a year later to 3 million. So you can see how fabulous the growth was. Most of the members are men, a very small percentage throughout the entire Reich period, less than 10% uh, of the Nazi party membership was actually card-carrying women. Women, however, dominated the larger sphere of the, the massive variety of national socialist associations, clubs, uh, groups of every uh, description, through which the National Socialists institutionalized their theories, institutionalized their policies, and institutionalized and implemented their policies. The men made the policies, the women carried them out, and they chose to do so. That is to say, the German women decided to become the agents of what Marian Kaplan, a very fine a feminist scholar of, of German Jewish women, uh, has described as the social death that German Jews, especially German women and German children, uh, German Jewish children, experienced before being deported and experiencing physical death, of being shut out of the neighborhood, of the school, of the shop, of the playground, when women, uh, German women, enforced the Nazi regulations. At the end of 1932, uh, the uh, Frauenschaft, the uh, Womanhood Corporation, is founded. It is the party uh, 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 organ for women. There were about 110,000 members in 1933. There are 850,000, and in 1934, 1.5 million. In 1933, uh, the Deutsches Frauenwerk, which is the women's enterprise, which coordinated all the various groups, uh, is formed. And there are 2.7 million women members in 35 and 4.0 million, 4 million in 1938. 
On January 1933, the day that Hitler takes power, uh, the National Socialist Party had approximately 850,000 members, two-thirds of them solidly middle class, one-third working class, about half of those unemployed. So you can see that it was the petty bourgeois and the, and, and the unemployed working class who were the big supporters of the Nazis. Very soon after the Nazis come to power, the Civil Service Act is passed on April 7th, which removes all non-Aryans, i.e. Jews, from the civil service and is used in the, in the successive years to push women out of the professional civil service as well. Women are persuaded to leave the civil service by the offering and acceptance of what were called marriage loans that were interest-free loans that were forgiven, one quarter of it was forgiven every time you had a child, up to four children, good deal. Wish they'd do that with student loans. Um, <laughs> as long as the woman would leave the workforce and never return. So this is basically the conditions uh, under which German women received Nazi propaganda. As I said, uh, they were ambivalent, as you can see here in this uh, poster from the 1932 election where women were heavily targeted. And you can see here a woman who appears to be, you know, eager and ready to vote for the Nazis and well, is just not quite uh, so sure. And what the Nazis did was they went out and they talked to women and they found out what they were thinking and what they were worried about. And then they admitted to those worries and they addressed those worries in their propaganda. And here you can see uh, th this particular poster was used for a campaign in which committed Nazi women were to go out and find an uncommitted neighbor and persuade her to come to the polls and vote Nazi. Uh, the Nazis made sure that they got the party information. Here you see the Der Sturmer uh, question or, or display case that was on corner after corner in every German city. And you see uh, that they are in public parks where women might be walking their babies. Or uh, this one is just outside a grocery store where the woman might pause uh, to read it uh, when she's going in or out. Here you see the, the image of the family, but you also see the mother. And take a good look at this image because this is uh, the base image really for the appeal to women. That they should return to the home uh, and not take a job from their own husbands. You can see there the dejected, unemployed veteran husband who's ashamed, he has no job. And the woman, his, her head is taller than his. And so the suggestion is that she's head of the family, which is to turn the family completely upside down. And you see the baby. The baby becomes very, very significant in this grouping, and as you shall see later. And the young boy, who appears again and again and again in this family grouping. And in this old uh, handwriting, it says, uh, rescue the German family. Vote for Hitler. This is an image that Germans would have been extremely familiar with. In fact, most people are familiar with it. It's, it's the Holy Family. Uh, this is Franz Ittenbach. This was a very famous painting well known to Germans. You have protective Joseph standing in the background over Mary who has the child on her lap. And to have the child on the lap, uh, the iconography, middle, uh, middle age iconography of this grouping meant that she was the source of all plenty. Her womb brought forth salvation and, and plenty. And of course the, the little lamb uh, was John the Baptist, but also a, a protective animal. And here's how it's translated into Nazi propaganda. Very, very different. Um, there again you see the child in the lap, in the womb, or, or emerging even almost from the womb. Uh, the beautiful blonde Aryan woman, the strong Aryan man, and behind him the ancient 
Adler, the symbol, all the way back to Charlemagne, of the German Empire. The waves are crashing on the shore. This is an unsettled sea, and the Adler is floating above, he above the head of the man, keeping watch of the family. What's very interesting is the way the figures are looking. The father and the child, presumably a son, are looking one direction, the woman's looking another. Why doesn't she get with the program? No? <laughs> the suggestion is women no longer have to worry. They are protected. Their future, the symbolized by the child, is secure. And this is what German women were longing for coming out of the crisis uh, period in the interwar years. This is the, uh, the cover of the calendar of the race political office of the National Socialist Party. Here's another one. I love this one. Uh, the Nazis were very, very good at using color, and they uh, were very good at branding red, black, and white with their colors, and they use them over and over and over and over again. So even if you don't see a swastika in the whole thing, and, and I've looked, I don't think there is one, uh, it's suggested, the swastika flag is suggested by the mere presence of the colors. Um, here is, once again, the Nazi family, but this time, very clearly, not just a German family, a committed Nazi family giving the Sieg Heil as the train, the, the, the powerful engine of the German economy that in 1937 is beginning to come back because they're gearing up to, for the war effort. And it says down at the bottom, our German railway. Uh, and if you were a German, you would read the details of this uh, poster. There's a garland on the front of the train, which means it's the Fuhrer's train. In other words, they're standing at the side of the tracks. They've rushed from the fields. They've rushed from the kitchen. They've rushed from the schoolyard to watch the Fuhrer go by and salute him devotedly. The women, woman is holding bread and vegetables. The daughter is, hol uh, is holding flowers. And look at the heads. The man's the tallest, the woman's the next, the son is the next, and the girl is the shortest. And it pretty much describes uh, the gender and age rankings uh, of the Nazi ideology. Uh, girls were often used to uh, soften the image of Hitler. Remember, he's, when he comes to the chancellorship, he is the head of the most radical, street brawling uh, uh, political party in the country, other than the communists. And so he has to be dignified, he has to be turned into a diplomat, at least appear to be, and a statesman. And if they have, the people have to be able to trust him. And so uh, the little girl who's leaning up against him says, seems to be saying, listen, if I trust him, why don't you? And indeed, you see this little girl staring out of a good number of posters right from this early period of his chancellorship when they're trying to establish him uh, as trustworthy. And girls, as did women, uh, found Hitler to be sexually uh, attractive. In fact, uh, almost insanely so. Uh, go figure. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's the mustache. But um, here you see uh, hit, uh, the reaction of girls to uh, Hitler entering a stadium at a youth rally. Just look at the expressions. I find this one of the most terrifying photographs uh, that we have in our permanent exhibit, especially because down front of the SS who have taken the place of the uh, children's parents. <coughs> The girls and the boys, however, were uh, uh, attracted to the youth activities differently. Boys, remember, could go into the leadership. And so here you have uh, posters for boys, aimed at boys that said, youth, serve the Fuhrer. Uh, all 10-year-olds uh, into the Hitler Youth. And uh, the little boy almost looks like a young Hitler. The suggestion is he can grow up to be a, a leader in the party. And here's the girls. This, I think, may be my favorite Nazi poster. 
it says, and you too belong to the Fuhrer. It's very demeaning uh, and really speaks of the second class citizen role that German women chose for their daughters. And here is, of course, the Bund Deutscher Mädel, the uh, League of German Girls, which was the female counterpart to the Hitler Youth. Uh, and all girls went into it at age 14, four years later than the boys would have gone into the Hitler Youth, because they're not training uh, for military service, which the boys are, actually. Um, they often did joint encampments with the boys, but this was unusual. Rather, they were trained to be the teacher of children and of other women. And here you see a young woman being trained to be a teacher. Uh, in a, she's learning to teach a, a racial science class. And down below, a young woman uh, from the, the uh, BDM uh, teaching um, young maids um, about racial science. And it was very important that girls uh, absorb the teachings of racial science uh, because they were the ones who were to pick the mates, not the other way around. And therefore they had to be aware of who were and were not fitting mates. And here you see a propaganda picture from Norden. And this is one of a series of photographs. There were 12 uh, mixed couples in this town in July 1935 who were uh, paraded through the town and harassed and humiliating. Uh, the, the Jewish man has a sign around his neck that says, I am a race polluter. And the German woman is deeply ashamed. And you see who's behind? prepubescent boys. They're getting the message. Don't love them. Don't touch them. And they, this whole campaign happens several months before this kind of relationship is forbidden by the Nuremberg Laws. It's not, it's not illegal yet. But already the campaign is going forward to, um, uh, to prepare the public to accept the Nuremberg Laws. This is a typical activity of German girls. I was going to call this uh, this program braids, 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 because <laughs> there's nary a picture where you don't find a girl in braids. It was considered the uh, proper hairdo, it really was. And the proper dress was, the, was either this uniform or a dirndl. Women rejected the dirndl, though, because it was uncomfortable. You couldn't do much of anything in it. Uh, easily. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But here, this is girls taking care of babies of mothers who have to work or do Nazi activities late in the day. And here you can see uh, a young woman of 18 who's passing out of uh, the uh, League of German Girls and is going into the next step of preparing women for uh, uh, motherhood. And that is a group that's called Faith and Beauty, in which they were to prepare their bodies for childbearing. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, here you see group exercises were often the, um, the vehicle for this preparation. They were not supposed to become muscular like men, but they were supposed to become strong, move freely, and be able to bear many children. And uh, this one, I, I, I couldn't believe these when I found them about a week ago, uh, because um, I, it never occurred to me that the propaganda ministry might have produced cheesecake photographs. <laughs> never did as part of, but, and of course it brought to my mind Betty Grable. Um, and I, I asked, well, were there any pinups produced by the uh, propaganda ministry for the men at the front, and lo and behold, there we go. And it says, fight for the cause, right? And she's pretty perky because this is before Stalingrad. Um, so they think they're winning. 
Um, and German women uh, still, however, especially the upper middle class women and the elite women, still continued uh, to uh, reject the Aryan ideal. And they followed very closely the fashion magazines. This is Die Dame, which was the main uh, fashion magazine uh, from the 1920s on. And you hear, uh, the, the one I think uh, on the right is fascinating because it's such a very British way to dress, uh, which is very, very popular among the upper classes. Um, negative portraits of Jewish women were also, also appeared in German propaganda. And uh, two books, which were really the cat in the hat and the little bear of their days, uh, children learned to read on these books, were violently anti-Semitic books. And the one that the little girl at the left is holding is a book called Trust No Fox in the Green Meadow and No Jew on His Oath. And it has pictures and text, uh, such as you see here, that compare uh, Jews unfavorably to um, uh, Gentiles and to, to Aryans, uh, and Aryan women to Jewish women. This is a very standard portrait of Jewish woman in Nazi propaganda. Obese, not terribly attractive, overdressed, suggestion of being haughty, uh, accompanied by her plutocrat husband, who is probably, uh, the way he's dressed is, is iconography for a, 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 a warmonger, someone who dealt in armaments. Um, you see this again and again. Der Sturmer would often go into the marketplaces and find a, a, a woman who in some way resembled this stereotype and uh, wait until she went up, say, and poked a, a goose that she was considered buying and then take her photograph and put some horrible caption under it talking about the greedy Jewish woman who rejected even quality meat. Um, this was the standard portrait of the Jewish woman uh, in Nazi propaganda. And this, of course, we're back to the mother. But not just any mother. We've been looking at urban women. Now this is the rural woman who is to reconnect Germany and her culture and her language and her traditions with the soil, which you see in the background. Her husband is farming. And again and again, when you see this image in all its different permutations, and you also see ag women, uh, uh, images of women plowing and so forth, you'll see this Dresden blue, the Virgin Mary blue. And it was picked uh, specifically for that. In the churches, you would see statues painted the veil of Mary with this color of blue. And it is to suggest that she is the new mother of the new savior, the blessed child of the master race who will take Germans into the future and save them from the race pollution they experience now. And here's a wonderful picture of, of the radio and its power in the rural areas. This is a group of German uh, farmers, including a woman who have, at the end of the day, dressed up in their very best to sit down and listen to an address from Hitler uh, from Berlin. Um, and it is as though he is there right with them in their um, in their living room. As the war moves on, uh, the child, uh, the image of the child is the future of the nation, and uh, how, uh, the suggestion that this nation and the child are endangered by hunger, by uh, bombing, and so forth, uh, turn up more and more in the propaganda. This says, therefore, we are fighting uh, for bread for our children. And you'll notice here, most of uh, the children are, are girls, and the central figure is, of course, the blonde, braided girl. Women uh, are pictured in propaganda of the war period as servants of the uh, Volksgemeinschaft, of the national community. They are nurses. They are teachers. They take up every role that I listed uh, at the beginning that they took at, in World War I, um, including 
uh, being air raid warned wardens. And this is a really fascinating photograph. It looks fuzzy, but that's the way it was painted. There was real controversy about allowing women, or requiring women actually, to participate as air wardens because the men were going off to the front. Someone had to do it. And so you see this very soft focus poster, curly hair, this big smile, this uniform that doesn't quite fit, the helmet that is just too big for her, and uh, sort of an ambiguous soundbite that says, woman in the air raid service, or it says, women in the air raid service? You don't know. And, and they kind of had to walk that fine line because women had been told, we don't need you in the factories. But as the war goes on and Germany is losing a half a million men a month, women have to come in and cover the industries, the postal service, the communications industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, uh, there were a lot of evidence that upper class women shirked uh, their duties and uh, really resolutely continued to live as they always had let. Uh, working women had been mobilized since the 1920s and they complained that the upper class women were not carrying their load. And here you see this wonderful propaganda photograph that had a very critical uh, caption. This uh, is in the cellar below the Opern, Opern Platz, the Opera Platz. Plots in, in Berlin. And what does this woman bring down to the shelter uh, when she goes to shelter during a bombing but her makeup kit? Near the end of the war, women are drafted in every capacity. And here you see again the family, but you notice something's missing. Mm -hmm. The boy, the oldest boy, where is he? He's on the front. Here's the youngest boy who is the baby in the lap. And where's the girl? And the mother's not in a dirndl, she's in a jumpsuit with a gas mask, and behind them, the ruin of the city. Frankfurt was declared a Frontstadt, that is, uh, Hitler declared certain uh, cities on the Western Front uh, had to be defended to the death. And here, you see a family saying, underneath their tattered Nazi flag, Frankfurt will be held, will be held. And this pretty much sums up the way in which, at the end of the war, the Nazis were talking to the people, using the images of women, about the either-or situation that they wanted uh, their, their public to think was the case. Victory or Bolshevism. Again, uh, the picture of the child as the sacred future, and the mother as the protector of the future. This is... A wonderful, wonderful, because this is us. This is the Americans. God forbid you should be taken by the Bolsheviks, but God forbid you should be taken by those culture terrorists, the Americans. And if you look real carefully up on the shoulders, you'll see two women. One uh, appears to be some kind of a stage performer with a trumpet and an Indian headdress, and the other one's a cheerleader or a majorette. This is their picture of the American woman, who of course is standing next to the Ku Klux Klan, uh, underneath that, uh, African American jazz, uh, either arm is uh, organized crime, out in this hand is plutocracy, is capitalist, down near the genitals are Jewish masons, and then the bombing, of course, of the European cities that destroys uh, the message uh, of this poster is destroys everything uh, in its path and replaces it with tawdry uh, American um, culture. This is the last photograph taken by uh, Hitler's um, personal photographer Heinrich Hoffmann, and it was taken just moments before he was captured uh, in his home city of Nuremberg. Uh, Germany uh, lay in May uh, 1945 in, what was the phrase, Schutt and Asch, in dust and ashes. And the beautiful medieval city of Nuremberg here is gone. And almost immediately, begins a new propaganda campaign. The Trümmerfrau, literally the rubble woman. Uh, and 
she is created uh, in reality by the American forces who need the rubble cleared away and if women will clean the bricks, stack them up, get them ready to be used again, they will get rations, extra rations. In the myth of the Truman woman, which is one of the founding myths of post-war Germany, propaganda myths of post-war Germany, she is the creator of the new nation, untainted by the uh, killings uh, committed by the men, supposedly. Um, it's a false picture. It's a deceptive picture, as we know, because as I said at the beginning, German women chose to follow the Nazis. They were the agents of the institutionalization of the discriminatory laws, the discriminatory institutions, and they modeled the indifference that Hitler needed his citizens to uh, have is their attitude toward the sufferings of their Jewish neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much for a powerful and memorable lecture. Now is our opportunity to ask some questions, particularly if you are outside in one of our overflow areas. We would appreciate if you take the opportunity to come inside to the auditorium and join us uh, for some question and answer uh, time. There are two microphones down here at the bottom of the stairs. If you are unable to come down to the stairs, I can do my best to try and come up to you if need be. I wonder if you could comment on the role of Lenny Riefenstahl, who of course has to oh, be yes. the most famous female yeah. propagandist mm -hmm. um, of mm -hmm. the, uh, the Nazi era. Mm -hmm. Although um, all German women were supposed to pull together and none were supposed to individualize themselves, certain German women were pulled out sort of uh, as uh, exemplary women, and one of them was, was Riefenstahl. Riefenstahl is a very controversial figure. She was a genius filmmaker, there's no doubt about it, for all its, its uh, horrible content, really, uh, when you think that it's a Nazi party rally. A uh, Triumph of the Will is brilliant cinematically. Um, techniques that she and her photographer, Walter Franz, Franz I beg your pardon, um, invented to do that film are still being used today uh, by cinematographers. However, uh, she didn't. <sighs> She didn't see herself as harming anyone, right to the end of her life at 101. Um, and she continues, to, continued really as a photographer and filmmaker, and when you look at her later films, they really look like something out of the 1930s, the, the films that she made about the Olympics, which really glorify the Aryan race. Um, she was uh, tried, uh, she was not tried at Nuremberg, uh, they just didn't have enough evidence. However, she, yeah, that's hard to believe when you see Triumph of the Will, but uh, she could argue and others argued, other filmmakers worldwide argued that, you know, this is an artistic piece, not a propaganda piece. However, after the establishment of the Federal Republic, West Germany, she was brought up, it was either four or five times on civil charges she had very good lawyers and got off all five times. However, Germany became a place she could no longer live. She lived for a while in California. She lived for a while in uh, Africa. Um, and, and I want to say she died in Mallorca, but I, 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 that may be wrong. That may be wrong. Other, other prominent women who were used in propaganda and allowed to individualize themselves were, of course, uh, Gertrud uh, Schultz-Klink, who is head of the Frauenschaft, a very unpleasant person, and uh, Hannah Reich, thank you, thank you, the great pilot 
extraordinary, a convinced Nazi. Uh, she really wanted to be a pilot and go bomb things. Um, and, and women like this. Uh, some movie stars as well, the great Zara Leander, for instance. They wanted to make Marlena Dietrich, of course, one of these uh, exceptional women, and she refused and left the country. Over here. Over on this side. Uh, in, when you began, you talked about uh, the uh, people losing faith in their democratic government and wanting to go back to something that was a little more authoritarian that had a little more <clears throat> uh, clear-cut lines. In uh, The Gathering Storm, Winston Churchill points out that one of the mistakes he considered the Allies to have made after the war was to destroy the monarchy and I think, you know, you mentioned the aristocracy. So the institutions the Germans revered and would respond to were, were gone. Mm -hmm. Do you think if those two institutions had been left in place that uh, there might have been, you know, less mm -hmm. chance for Hitler to have come to power? It's a great question. Um, this is a long standing and, and, and uh, now with the anniversary of World War I uh, this year, a revived debate. Uh, was the demand that the Kaiser abdicate and all the provisions of the, the onerous provisions of the uh, Versailles Treaty, specifically the, the, um, the reparations, massive reparations, which the Germans only paid off a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, also the loss of the military and the great tradition that was at the heart of, of German society. Um, there's a great debate as to whether or not um, World War II, World War One should have been ended and settled in treaty differently. I think most historians are beginning to move toward uh, uh, that the reparations were far uh, in excess of what Germany was capable of of paying, in, and and at the same time recovering from a devastating war. And feel free, you may certainly come down during an answer as well. And there are microphones on either side. Uh, just a comment first. Wasn't the Marshall Plan a reaction actually to Versailles? I, yeah, that argument has been made, yes. Yes. The uh, question is, are there any comparative studies that show that women reacted in different ways under, or in fact the reaction of the German woman wasn't any different than one would expect in other situations where there was a war going on. Uh, are there cases where the woman in general you, uh, differed from the, the men at the time? Do you have, are there similar studies? Uh, I haven't come, uh, no, across that. Um, there are interesting studies and a debate going on uh, as to whether uh, uh, um, whether there was feminist resistance to Nazi policy on women. Um, and that's really kind of a hot, hot debate right now, whether German feminists uh, resisted Hitler at any level. But no, I, I'm not aware of any, any studies of the kind here. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to in, uh, invite Dr. Naylor back to the podium. Other than to say that this, that basically propaganda works pretty much the same from society to society because human beings are human beings right. and have desires and hopes and needs and fears and wants to which propaganda speaks. And I guess what I'm saying yeah. is I don't think the reaction that you brought up is that, was that unexpected. It may not have been. Yeah. If you have more questions or would like to continue the conversation afterwards, I'm sure Dr. Villan will be available. Thank you. So, 
what a what a tremendous what a tremendous presentation, Dr. Mullen. Thank you very much for being with us and for the first. We're pleased that it's the first lecture that you're given. Clearly, a topic about which you have great mastery. We're so grateful. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Mullen for the presentation tonight.